Well, welcome. We hope you're all having a wonderful start to fall. My name is Jessica Keating Floyd, and I direct the Notre Dame Office of Life and Human Dignity in the McGrath Institute for Church Life. And my co-host is Carter Sneed. Carter, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, yes, I will introduce myself. Thank you, Jess. (laughs) I'm Carter Sneed. I'm the professor of law and uh, concurrent professor of political science here at Notre Dame. And I'm also the director of the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. So the DeNicola Center and the McGrath Institute have teamed up to bring you a series of panels to discuss the wide ranging impact of Dobbs um, for medical care providers, for policymakers, and of course, most importantly, for the well-being of women and children. If you missed our first panel, you can view the recording on either YouTube page of the McGrath Institute or the Center for Ethics and Culture. And it's our pleasure now to introduce our panelists. We are delighted to be joined by Mary Bauer, who is a certified nurse midwife and director of midwifery services at Ascension Health St. Mary of Nazareth Hospital in Chicago. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. We're also joined by Charlie Camosi, Professor of Medical Humanities at the Creighton University School of Medicine. Welcome, Charlie. And Dr. Karen Dehan, Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Loyola University Health System and Chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Gottlieb Memorial Hospital. And finally, we're joined by uh, Joseph Piccioni, a Ministry Ethicist for the OSF Healthcare System in Peoria, Illinois. Welcome to all of our panelists. Without further ado, let's begin. So those of you who joined us last time will recall that we were discussing uh, our conversation focused on questions, difficult questions that really focus on the clinical context involving the delivery of health care to women uh, and and babies, Uh, difficult, hard cases, if you will. We had a a great conversation with uh, eminent practitioners that shed a great deal of light on on a lot of questions that have been bedeviling the public conversation in that regard. Today, we're gonna shift our focus a little bit more to the practitioner, away from the patient and more to the practitioner to talk about how in a post-Dobbs world, uh, the the practice of medicine uh, has changed and um, and what the opportunities are and the challenges are and the imperatives are to care for moms and babies and families in a comprehensive way. Uh, We're gonna start our conversation today uh, with an assessment of the current landscape uh, for all of these healthcare providers. We're gonna focus specifically on a couple of very influential professional societies. Uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Board of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have been, at least at their executive level and their official statements, outspoken proponents of abortion, even going so far as to call it a standard of care in certain circumstances, which have significant consequences in the malpractice context and on uh, professional disciplinary matters. We'd like to start with the question, uh, we'd like to uh, direct this question to Dr. Dehan. How has this, how is the position of these professional societies, as influential as they are, how they affected the medical profession uh, vis-a-vis abortion? What challenges face doctors who are opposed to abortion as a matter of conscience or who believe that abortion is not in fact um, acting in the best interests of their patients as they understand it in light of their training uh, and the goals of medicine itself? Dr. Dehan. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it really, you know, ACOG and ABOG have really changed the narrative um, specifically of, of my specialty, obstetrics and gynecology, uh, since I finished residency back in, in 1990. You know, when, when I chose OBGYN as a specialty, I and everyone else that I worked with, you know, chose this specialty because, you know, our goal is we wanted to deliver healthy moms and healthy babies. We wanted to diagnose, treat, manage, you know, gynecologic cancers, you know, abortion really wasn't a reason that any of us chose obstetrics and gynecology. It really wasn't, you know, talked about. We knew, you know, we knew it was there. It wasn't done at at, at any place that I'd ever worked at. No one had any expressed any desire to want to be involved in abortion. And, you know, over the years with um, the American College and the American Board taking such a strong pro-abortion stance, the whole nature of the specialty has changed in, in, um, you know, over the years. And because of that, it's changed medical education in terms of the medical students and the residents that I work with. And, you know, sadly, because of their stance, a lot of medical students and residents don't, you know, or, or the medical students don't think that they can choose OBGYN as a specialty. I have had 
you know, dozens of medical students come and talk to me and say, I'm really interested in obstetrics and gynecology, but the current nature of, of the specialty scares me. I don't know if I can do it. And that is, you know, really disappointing to me because, you know, there's a lot of very qualified uh, physicians, you know, physicians in training that might otherwise choose obstetrics and gynecology. And because of this strong stance of ACOG and ABOG, they don't feel comfortable that this is a, a, a milieu that they can practice in. And I have had my own thoughts as I try to guide the medical students and say, yes, you, you can do that. We, we need you. We need you in this specialty. You can do this. I look back and I think it, it's, it's so strident these days. I, I'm not entirely sure that, that I would pick it again, which is um, very disappointing. So I, you know, I think with medical education, a residency is probably one of the greatest impact. And then when you look at, so what does that mean? And for those um, you know, who, who it's against their conscience. You know, I think one thing is when you get out of residency, I think it's, it's going to be harder to get a job because that started to be somewhat of a litmus test for um, practicing obstetrics and, and gynecology that you are, you know, a, a proponent of, you know, so-called reproductive health or, or reproductive justice. So, you know, I think there's a lot of sort of negative things uh, that you know, ABOG and ACOG have have sort of um, created. It's uh, it's interesting because uh, it's in some ways a paradox because a ACOG um, speaks as though they speak for the entire organization, all the members. But recent social science studies, in fact, surveys of the junior and regular fellows of ACOG, showed that only twenty three percent of them perform abortions at all. And then they were asked, and then only 7% of OBGYNs in private practice perform abortions. Uh, and then when they were asked a follow-up question in the study, I think Guttmacher was involved in the study, they asked them, why wouldn't uh, these folks uh, prescribe pills for abortions? So they focused on the question of medication or chemical abortion. And over a third of them said because they had moral objections to it, uh, which is quite striking because you would imagine, as you just said, especially people going into medicine, thinking that they shouldn't uh, go into OBGYN as a specialty, when in fact, the vast majority of OBGYNs do not perform abortions, and many, many, a significant percentage, uh, clearly choose not to because they don't regard it as ethical or consistent with what they believe is the uh, best interest of, of the patient, mother, or, or certainly baby. Let's uh, give the other panelists a chance, if they wish, they don't have to, to respond to this same question. Let's go, uh, Nurse Bauer, please. Hi, um, I'd like to also bring uh, nurses and nurse midwives into this conversation um, because I need to call attention to the fact that the American College of Nurse Midwives is also radically pro-abortion. And there is a, a subset caucus within the American College of Nurse Midwives uh, called Pro-Life Midwife Caucus. Um, I had been a member of that caucus for a number of years. Um, and it seems that it's counterintuitive that midwives would even be pro-abortion when our whole field kind of got its foundation in birthing babies. Um, so it's, it's changed drastically in my own career as well. I felt very comfortable becoming a midwife. Um, today, the American College of Nurse Midwives has become so radical, even at um, the, con the conventions, the annual meetings that we have, that they have abortion training classes that are available. Um, at the last uh, meeting that I was at, uh, we had a meeting of the Pro-Life Midwife Caucus. We're always relegated to a 6.30 or 7 a.m. meeting in a meeting room in the basement of whatever hotel we're at. And um, I was speaking at that conference on um, my experience with um, the abortion pill reversal protocol. And they actually planted pro-abortion midwives in that audience to heckle me and to disrupt my train of thought as I was speaking um, there. And for an organization that claims to embrace diversity, um, they don't embrace diversity of opinion on this particular topic. 
Thank you for that. That's an important perspective. Um, and for another uh, one of our panelists who has done a great deal of work on, on the question of nursing and the ethics of nursing, uh, Dr. Charlie Camosi, what, 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 what are your thoughts, if any, uh, on this question about the role of these professional societies creating an atmosphere uh, that seems to want to crowd out any other alternative voices on the life issue? Well, there's obviously lots of reasons to be um, pessimistic and, and sad <laughs> about this, but I just want to highlight a story that many of us are aware of, but I think is worth focusing on that give us reason for hope. Many of you know Dr. Christian Collier at the University of Michigan Medical School, friend of both of the societies that are supporting uh, this event today. And uh, what has been astonishing, at least to me, about her, um, you know, very publicly giving the white coat ceremony plenary address and being walked out on by several students um, and faculty members and others, although not as many as you might think, what's been astonishing is the level of support she's gotten, even from pro-choice students. So there is a lot of reason to be hopeful that if we stand up, if the right people stand up, if they get the right support about this, that there can be changes made. There can be um stands made that are helpful. Let me just finish by saying this. I think if we get a pipeline going um, of even all the way back to middle school, I'm, I'm doing some lectures for um, Lumen Verum Academy online, a new school, Catholic school out of the Archdiocese of Boston. And there are future healthcare providers in in the classes that I'm I'm lecturing to virtually there. And if one of the things that Kristen did so well at the University of Michigan is is mentor also pro-life students that need uh you know um advice about various things, including applying for residencies and whatnot. If we can get a pipeline together, um I think this would really be helpful in kind of turning the tide to make sure those students are supported all the way through. And finally, uh Joseph, would you like to add anything to uh, this this line of conversation? Uh, thank you so much. Um, just from our experience in medical education of uh, decades ago, I was asked by a medical student who was pro-life and strongly Catholic if I could help her find a residency program in OBGYN that would protect her not only from abortion, but, but doing tubal ligations. And so I was able to uh, craft a protected place for her in our residency program that is sponsored by the University of Illinois. Uh, there's the College of Medicine in Peoria. So we have created spaces for persons and for, uh, for students and residents in general. But you know, uh, with the heightened level post Dobbs and pre-election of abortion conversation, many medical students are just who are pro-life are giving each other the message maybe we should just be quiet for now. Mm -hmm. And and so that that really doesn't create the type of open academic atmosphere that we would wish, but they're doing it to protect themselves. I see, thank you for that. Uh, Jess? Thank you to all of our panelists. I wanna shift us um, to a case that's come up uh, repeatedly since the Dobbs decision, both by um, the medical professional organizations we've just been talking about, but also by doctors who have said that the lack of access to abortion um, means that they can't treat their patients. And that case is the 2012 case of Savita Halapanavar, a pregnant woman in Ireland who tragically died of infection and septic shock because her doctors failed to provide her proper miscarriage treatment. And citing, these doctors cited the prohibition of abortion in Ireland at the time. And as we all know, this case was used to overturn um, or amend Ireland's constitution on um, fetal rights. So this case has been cited quite a bit in the weeks and months since the Dobbs decision. And so I'd like us to think about um, what role hospital ethics committees uh, can play in reconciling so these ethical con conflicts tied to legal conflicts? And how should ethicists be advising doctors on what the standard of care is in a post-row world? Um, Dr. Piccone, Piccione, I'd like to start with you. Oh, thank you very much. And I work within Catholic healthcare. And in OSF, we have a, a, a robust uh, staff of clinical ethicists who are scattered across the system so that we can be of advice to people on the ground. Uh, might I also say that within Catholic healthcare, we have a national document that's promulgated by USCCB called the Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Healthcare Services. 
and it's in its sixth edition. The bishops in their November meeting might amend it a bit. Uh, and also it's a bestseller for USCCB. Uh, ERD, in a way, carries the wisdom tradition of the church uh, into succinct statements. There is a risk that persons can over or under interpret ERD, but ERD 45 is one of those directives in which every single word counts. And it speaks of abortion as the directly intended termination of pregnancy. And it continues. And then the next sentence, every procedure whose sole immediate effect is the termination of pregnancy before viability is an abortion. Uh, and so when we heard of the Halaponovar case, we were very saddened uh, because we believe that in the States, we would have implemented ERD 45, but also the following directives, which are more general in tone to reflect our wisdom tradition of recognizing that yes, we have two patients, mother and baby, but sometimes we can only save one. And we followed the Halapanovar case closely. It was tragic, but there were admissions by the Irish hospital that they were not a Catholic facility, that they were not under Catholic ethos. And it turned out that it was really a liability case. It was a poor screening for her advanced condition, a not timely response to her, and that the, there was a several hundred thousand uh, a euro settlement between her family and the hospital. Yes, of course, that case was used uh, to advance the overturning of the uh, Irish constitutional provision banning abortion. But from a Catholic healthcare perspective, we would not have seen that as an abortion. Dr. Kamosi, you've done quite a lot of work on this case, and you are currently um, teaching bioethics at a Catholic hospital or Catholic medical school. I, I'd love to hear sort of your thoughts on both the case itself, but also the role, how hospital ethics committees can be more proactive in informing doctors about ethical decision making. Yeah, the case is incredibly frustrating for reasons that I think many of us are frustrated right now. Um, the Our opposition uh, and the Irish pro-life opposition, the pro-choice opposition, they really were dishonest, frankly, in how they uh, narrated the case um, with the with intended goal in mind. It was an overturn prenatal justice as, as articulated in the Irish constitution, and they won. And I can, I can see, you know, the... Um, Unfortunately, maybe the the sprouts of something similar happening here in the United States. There's a lot of disinformation, a lot of disingenuous arguments made about uh, these matters. But part of the problem is, and it's a it's a wicked problem for us, is that especially in the Catholic tradition, we do have a kind of prudential judgment type situation where we look at each individual case and and what's the object of the act and what what's foresee merely foreseen and uh, not intended. And, and one of the things I think we need to do, particularly now, is get some very, very clear guidelines in place, maybe even have a new ERD directed at situations where we are talking about saving the life of the mother in these situations, because we can uh, be in good faith here, and, and we all are in good faith here, but our opponents are, are largely not. And, and so I think we need to really hit the culture, hit ethics committees, hit uh, institutions um, over the head with what we do and what we don't do, but still making <laughs> making space as our tradition does for those hard cases where we have to do prudential judgment. I'd like to invite um, Dr. Dehan and Nurse Bauer into the conversation as a sort of practicing in the field, um, how you think about ethical directives in your decision making. Um, feel free to reflect on the Halaponovar case as well, but to bring in that practical on the ground um, application of, in, of decision-making in sometimes challenging cases. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead if it's okay, Mary. Um, you know, sadly, this is a situation that we face, you know, as practicing, uh, you know, obstetricians, we face not infrequently this very tragic um, situation of premature rupture of membranes, um, pre-viable. And uh, I have not changed, and no one that I've worked with has changed their practice over the years in managing this, um, you know, tragic complication. And it's monitoring. And we all know how to monitor for choreoamnionitis. We all know the signs of infection. 
Um, and, and I think what's, what's been done in that case is a, an indicated induction of labor that's necessary to save the mother's life is, has been termed an abortion. And I, you know, I, and that's, that's not correct as Dr. Piccioni referenced to the, the ERDs. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think that that's sort of the, the crux of the case and the, they're used, and, and you know, this is being used as um, a situation that's being termed more in a negative aspect, where it is again the situation of, as again, as Dr. Piccioni said, two patients, and we do the best we can for both patients, and and sometimes we're not able to save both patients. But you know, th- this is a situation that that you know we see very frequently. Thank you, Dr. Dehan. Nurse Bauer? No. Um, we'll also see um, cases where there's an ectopic pregnancy. And um, the moms are very upset about this because they don't always understand where the location of that pregnancy mm-hmm. is and that it is not viable no matter what we can do for them. And, um, you know, we, we have some patients um, that are. Um, in the Latino population, very faith-filled, um, consider this possibly an abortion. We have a great uh, obligation to teach them um, uh, exactly what is happening in their bodies. And that as I work also in a Catholic hospital, um, we do not consider that an abortion. That baby will never be viable in its location outside the uterus. And um, the risks of the mother can be very great if we don't intervene. I want to thank you all for um, responding to that. Um, and Charlie, pick up on your point and Dr. Piccioni's point, as well as Dr. Dehan and Nurse Bauer, um, that, that doctors know what the protocols are um, and how to treat their patients, but that we have maybe like a, a public facing challenge of really making clear um, in, on ethics boards and two OBGYNs practicing potentially in non-Catholic hospitals, what the ethical guidelines are for treatment of patients. Thank you so much. I want to uh, pitch it back to Carter. So our next um, couple of questions are going to be about uh, the use of drugs to induce abortions. We've, we've already seen uh, RU-46 and abortion drugs have um, uh, method, you know, methoprostone, misoprostol have Kind of revolutionized um, the the, uh, the 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 performance of abortions. Uh, it's a huge and growing percentage of abortions that are uh, that are um, induced in this way. And you see in other countries the 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 rates of chemical or drug abortions are significantly higher than surgical abortions. Um, counterintuitively, the evidence seems to suggest that complications and difficulties for the mother. Uh, are actually more significant in the context of the drug-induced abortion than the surgical abortion. That that is in some ways counterintuitive, at least if I'm understanding the social science correctly. Um, so we'd like to we'd like to ask our panelists just a general question. We're going to get more specific in the next question. Just how how do you see uh, the prescription of 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 abortion-inducing drugs? And especially we're going to be seeing now um, at, with those jurisdictions like Indiana that restrict access to surgical abortion and, for, and, and ban the use of abortion inducing drugs, the use, uh, the, this, this sort of distribution across state lines um, uh, into our state. Uh, uh, they're going to flood and they're already talking about flooding our, our state with, with these drugs. They're encouraging women to stock up on these drugs um, in, in advance of, um, uh, of, of a future need to get an abortion in states like Indiana, even though the use of those drugs is illegal, although the mothers are immunized, anybody who has accomplice liability around that would presumably be prosecutable. Um, so our, our general question, what does it mean for the drugs and the mailing of drugs and the use of telemedicine and perhaps even unsupervised use of these drugs? How do you see that changing the practice of medicine um, and, and, the, and, and the safety of mothers and of course of, of babies? M- Mary, if it's okay, why don't we start with you? Uh, Nurse Bauer, why don't we start with you, and then we'll go around the the group as well. Well, um, when patients can obtain these drugs basically unfettered, um, they really don't have any opportunity to discuss any concerns regarding uh, taking them, side effects, 
um, contraindications for taking them uh, with a provider um, that may be completely knowledgeable. Um, a lot of pro-abortion advocacy groups are now putting um, websites up online where you can call and talk to a person, not necessarily a nurse midwife or an advanced practice nurse or a physician, and they may ask them a couple of cursory questions. And in overnight mail, they're receiving abortion pills to be taken in the privacy of their own home without any supervision. Um, and that can be extremely dangerous for patients. Mary, could you give us a few more sentences on what the precise dangers and complications are, uh, especially as you've seen them in your practice? Um, the biggest uh, risk, I think, to moms would be hemorrhage and bleeding. Um, Dr. Dehan may agree with me on that if they're taking them at home. Um, and, you know, a mom could bleed out at home if she has nobody there. She might be taking these pills in total privacy. She may not want her sister, her mother, her best friend, or anybody to know that she is doing this. And she could be found dead on the bathroom floor. I mean, that is a reality. Although the risk of uh, hemorrhaging is considered to be low, sometimes there are also organizations that are kind of pushing the envelope on the restricted uh, guideline as far as 70 days um, to provide abortion pills. They may kind of push the envelope to say, well, she's 11 and a half weeks, we can try um, giving them to uh, a patient. And your risk of hemorrhage goes up, I think, considerably more after 10 weeks. Um, and that, I think, is, is probably the, big, the biggest risk. But not, you know, knowing a woman's health um, and not being able to give good guidance um, really puts her at, at a lot of risk and socially as well, not just the risk of the medication, but um, not having the support that she needs to make the right decision. Dr. Dehan, we'd love to uh, to hear your, your thoughts on this, and especially as a, a physician. I mean, as a doctor thinking about what the practice of medicine is and how to do so ethically and with the, at the highest degree of professional excellence and care for your patients to actually to act in the good of your patients as you've been trained to as a physician at the core of the art of medicine directs you to, how does this sort of shift, this growing shift in the direction of the, dis the dispensing of abortifacient drugs, telemedicine, and even as we just heard from Mary, unsupervised um, use of these drugs. How, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I, I, the, the abortion pill to me is particularly frightening. And, you know, for, for some of the reasons that you just said, and women are taking the abortion pill without proper supervision or without proper examination beforehand to know things like, how far along in the pregnancy are they? Do they have any bleeding diathesis or contraindications to taking the medicine? Do they possibly have an ectopic pregnancy where um, that would be catastrophic? If she could have a ruptured ectopic if she thought she had an intrauterine pregnancy that she was going to abort and took the abortion pill and ended up having a ruptured ectopic. As, as Mary said too, it's really hard to counsel someone, I think, on how much bleeding is, you know, how much bleeding is appropriate. You're going to take these pills and you're going to have this amount of bleeding. And, you know, it, it's 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 a lot of bleeding. And, you know, and, um, you know, should you stay home? Should you go to the emergency room? We see patients every week in the emergency room who come in after having taken the abortion pill that are either bleeding heavily or worried about bleeding heavily and um, follow up. And then they're in the emergency room. Most of the time they have no relationship with any practitioner. They are sort of on their own. They show up and they haven't formed a relationship with anyone to help them, you know, not only with the medical complications, but then the sort of emotional and psychological complications of having gone through this maybe at home by themselves, ending up bleeding, ending up in the emergency room and sort of uh, to me, the narrative is very much, oh, it's so easy. You take the abortion pill, you stay home for a couple hours, it's all done. The next day you go about your business. And that's another huge disservice I see that this is being promoted as such an easy, complication-free thing to do. And that is that is just not the case. Yeah. Can I, I just one follow-up question? How, how is it possible for a person 
to um, seek a prescription or to seek access to abortion drugs from from people outside of your state, maybe even outside of your country? How does that work? I mean, how does that work? I, I, I have to be honest and say, I don't know exactly. I mean, I don't I think it may differ state to state and and what one can do. Um, you know, I know there's there, I know there's availability of many prescription drugs from some, you know, Canadian pharmacies and other things. But um, I don't I don't honestly know how that how that's obtained. Mm-hmm. Well, there's um, several organizations that will provide them um, via the Internet. Um, a couple of them that I looked into. One's called Carafem. There's another one called HeyJane.com. Um, and they will some of them do a video consult ahead of time and, and others don't. And they charge anywhere from $280 to 400 bucks for these pills, but they don't offer an ultrasound, as Dr. Dehan said, to verify the number of weeks they're pregnant and so forth. But they're out there. And um, these pro-abortion advocacy groups are becoming more and more and more vocal on the internet. They really are. Yeah, no, we, we see that. Uh, among even on our campus, we see we see um, uh, advertisements uh, in, in with QR codes in in bathrooms uh, right, right. Where, where students are you know, with the most extraordinary, dishonest and 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 deeply disturbing language. Want to become unpregnant? It asks the question. Wow. Take Plan C. These are deeply, deeply dangerous, unethical, and problematic. Um, streams of information that are being circulated, I'm sure, all over the country in those in those places where they imagine people are going to not have access to surgical abortion in those jurisdictions where it's where the legislature has decided that they want to protect mothers, babies and families through the through the mechanisms of the law and forbid the use of these drugs. Um, it's ter- it's heartbreaking. Uh, Dr. Kamosi, we'd love to hear your, your input on this question about the, the proliferation, the shift to uh, prescriptions of drugs and the use of drugs in this way. Yeah, we're, um, we're not ready for this. It seems to me. And, um, and, uh, and we're, but we're, we're learning fast and we're, we're making some moves. I, I guess one, one, one thing I wanted to mention is pro-life movement has for decades now thought about, um, what it would mean to have prenatal justice and ban most, if not all abortions and still have legal abortions done. And we've been thinking about that in a, surgical abortion context, I think for the most part, but obviously what presents uh, in front of us now is the prospect of illegal abortions being done this way in a much more systematic and, and nefarious way. And I, I think it underscores, I mean, nobody's a stronger proponent of prenatal justice than I am in wanting uh, babies, prenatal children protected in law, just like any other person. Um, but I think it really does underscore um, the importance of winning the culture. We have to win the culture and uh, changing the law is part of that. Recognizing prenatal justice is part of that. But but this new threat, I think, just underscores how much um, uh, the, the the winning the culture question is before us. That's a that's a really important point, point. Um, and it is frustrating because it's hard to break through sometimes with the message of solidarity and unconditional love and care and a genuine understanding of what the good of medicine is as a as a field of healing and wholeness rather than simply a, a problem solving uh, intervention. Uh, but it's hard as you, Charlie, as you had said earlier, when, the, when the, the, the sort of public discourse is flooded with misinformation and flooded with some, some genuine confusion by well-meaning people who are terrified and, and we have to obviously be sympathetic and compassionate about that. But then there's some other people also who are, I think, uh, trying to create ambiguities and and even misinformation for the sake of promoting a particular ideological agenda, and that's 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 not that's not okay to do. Um, and Charlie, you've been a great uh, proponent and, and, and uh, sort of antidote to this with your own writing, as has others, everyone else on this on this panel with your per- personal witness, and we're just grateful for that. Um, Dr. Piccioni, we'd like to get your thoughts, please, on the question of the proliferation of abortion drugs and how that affects the. The, the practice of medicine, delivery of health care? Yes, we believe that uh, 50% of abortions now are chemical rather than surgical. We, we don't know exactly which um, individual practitioners might be in that direction. Certainly in Illinois, every planned parenthood clinic now offers chemical abortions. So it's 
it's much more vocal in the past and it's becoming much more present. Yes, and we see the risks for it. Although, Professor Steed, could I continue with the thought that you had about conversation in general? I think that Catholic healthcare is at the intersection of, uh, of medicine and our faith tradition of the healing community. And we recognize that our, um, our mission partners in Catholic healthcare and external physicians, we are all motivated by humanitarian instincts. We struggle though now more than ever with overlapping definitions of what abortion might be or what might good medical interventions would be, such as in the Irish case. And we have to be more intentional than ever in creating some kind of common forum because it's not happening in public right now, but internally so that we can work on certain terminology. Uh, and it, it is a risky time for discourse. And as you said earlier, we are motivated by love. ERD uh, for Catholic Healthcare says that the animating principle, and that's, that's the strongest theological line for me in ERD, the strong, the animating principle of Catholic health care is the love of Christ. Yeah. That's very beautifully said, doctor. Thank you for that. Um, and I agree. If I could a ask you a follow-up question, I, I agree with you. As, as a, a law professor and as a legal scholar, uh, the question of language and nomenclature and defining with particularity what an abortion is versus what is merely an intervention that has the foreseeable uh, but regrettable consequence of, of leading to the death of the unborn child, for example, uh, premature delivery of a child following, you know, if the membrane ruptures, you're delivering a pre-viable child uh, and doing everything you can to, to care for that child, but it's just not possible to save his or her life. Um, the law has to be very specific in what it defines as abortions. And there are some good examples of that. We saw that um, uh, in our previous webinar, where we talked about how we took some, we looked at some model language from different state statutes yes. that defined abortion very specifically with respect to the intention of the act itself, uh, and which distinguishes it, and, and for that matter, the factual circumstances around it. So, a miscarriage, removal of the remains of an unborn child, is not is not an abortion in the statutory language, but in the, because. Uh, it is not a, it's not an action with the intention of, of bringing about the death of the innocent child. And intention is a tricky thing. I mean, it means different things in moral theology than it does in law. Uh, foreseeability is treated differently, uh, especially in malpractice law and in the law of negligence. Um, but uh, but if I could just ask you a follow up, Dr. Piccioni, uh, what would be what would be your advice in terms of how we might be more precise internally in the Catholic community? Using which words to describe what it, you know the, the the nature of these can, these actions and how we can bring light rather than more confusion. What would you if you were if you were writing on a blank slate? What might you what might you add? So I, I think that uh, again ethical and religious directives gives us some very good language. It's widely circulated. It is normative for Catholic healthcare. ERD the bishops say is policy in every Catholic institution. And so it gives us some good definitions. So with the, the premature rupture cases, that would be ERD 47. And it begins by saying, you know, if it's not, in, it, the intention is not abortifacient, it may be pursued. Uh, so we do have our own internal language. Uh, those who are advocating for abortion, and again, we saw this clearly in the Irish case, are trying to say abortion was the only option. The medical review of the Helipenar case said that delivery should have been expedited, you know, which in another way is saying induced labor or early delivery. That would be the language we would use in the Catholic tradition. And certainly for almost the last century, one of the rationales for that would be for an opportunity for baptism while the baby was still alive. You know, so, so we are accustomed to tragic events. You know, with advances in medical technology, we can save both mother and child uh, better. And, and medical practitioners strive, you know, even when we have uh, some rem membrane ruptures to be able to continue the pregnancy to a viable date. The Irish case was 17 weeks. And if it was, you know, the type of rupture and the, uh, the, the sepsis that followed, and there was perhaps even a suggestion that it would have been an antibiotic resistant infection, well, then we face the reality of 
the pregnancy has essentially failed. Abortion is not the answer. The pregnancy has failed. How do we induce labor? So it's always language and clarification because even with our, within our Catholic healthcare community, we'll have colleagues who really need the assurance that what we're doing is morally sound. And so we have to be a community of communication. And so I, I would advocate for Catholic healthcare to invest in ethicists who can promote that type of conversation and to further it. If you don't mind, Dr. Piccione, I'd like to ask you one follow-up question really quickly. Um, I, I have read some literature put out by some Catholic bioethics institutes that, that really would say early delivery is abortion. Um, and that seems to me problematic um, on several levels. But how, even internally, sort of in, at, in Catholic hospitals, how do we sort of assure that everybody is on the same page and reading from the same playbook to protect moms and babies? Yeah, uh, thank you. When, when we uh, look at the history of Catholic theology, we have uh, many different uh, schools of thought. And so we don't have always a history of agreement. Mm -hmm. We have a, a, a history of disagreement, uh, sometimes putting new perspectives to it. But from the position of hierarchical teaching, I think that it would be out of step with the mainstream of Catholic thought to consider the, saving the life of the mother when the pregnancy has clearly failed as, as abortifacient. Uh, again, this is where overlapping... Mm -hmm. um, definitions come in because some in a medical definition one might say for abortion that it is a, a medic that the pregnancy simply failed in the same way that in airline travel you know we would abort a takeoff or abort a landing theologically that's where intention comes in so my response to an individual who would make the claim that it's always and everywhere an abortion would be let's look at the facts of a specific case can an individual practitioner make a wrong judgment or a hurried judgment that the pregnancy has in fact failed? Or uh, by my conversations with the physicians over the years, they know our moral framework and we share a vision that our, our patients are mother and child each and that we, we will advocate for both. Thank Again, you so much. this continued conversation is important. Thank you so much. Um, I want to take a moment to um, to talk about abortion pill reversal since we're talking about chemical abortion. Um, and Mary, particularly since you brought up um, your experience of being heckled um, talking about it, can you tell us about abortion pill reversal, um, how it works, um, and also how how we can more effectively get the message out about abortion pill reversal? Um. The abortion pill um, reversal protocol is basically um, larger doses of progesterone, which is a hormone that your body makes to sustain a pregnancy. And when a woman goes to have a medication abortion, there are two drugs involved. The mifepristone is the first medication, and then we give her mesoprostol on the second day to expel the contents of the uterus. The mifeprestone lines the uterus. And when we give the progesterone to a mom in a large amount, it competes with the mifeprestone sites on the uterine lining. So it kind of can knock them off and help sustain the pregnancy. Um, unfortunately, the study um, that has been the backbone of this protocol um, was small in nature and uh, it was published in 2018. Um, and the number of cases that, that were involved was small enough that the American College of Nurse, of Nurse Midwives, you know, American College of OBGYNs, everybody is saying not enough information you really shouldn't be doing anything with progesterone without larger studies. Um, but the protocol, I'll, I'll go, we, we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but the protocol itself is to try to intercede uh, after a woman has only taken the day one of her abortion pills. 
if she's taken the second, um, we really can't help her. So there's a small number of women that will decide after taking the first pills for what a number of reasons that they made a mistake and they regret it and they are desperate to try to reverse it and save this pregnancy. And um, we try to start them on uh, progesterone within the protocols have 72 hours. Ideally, first 24 hours would be um, more effective, hopefully, but it's only works up to a certain point in pregnancy. So um, you can't be giving it, you know, after the 10 weeks. I mean, that the abortion pills are given up to 10 weeks. So um, sometimes we'll get a patient who is only six weeks pregnant. And um, it, it seems from the anecdotal part of that study, the earlier that we can intervene with the abortion pill reversal protocol of the progesterone, the greater likelihood of success. Um, and there's a, a lot of uh, pushback from our professional organizations to, not to use it. Um, I feel that um, we have an ethical duty to our patients uh, to offer this, especially in a Catholic healthcare setting, um, because it involves basically two ethical principles. Um, one of them is non-maleficence. So basically don't, don't harm your patient. Um, we have, you know, a practical application to weigh the benefits versus the risks and choose the best course of action with our patient. Um, the second principle that's involved in this really is beneficence. Um, it's our moral obligation to act for the benefit of our patients, um, to do the right thing and to look toward the patient's good. And when a patient is coming to us, asking us for help to save the life of their child, their human child, um, it's hard to harden your heart and say, well, it's a small amount of evidence, so I'm not sure we should use it. Um, prayerfully, I have used it uh, for a number of patients. I was uh, part of the organization uh, that was uh, prescribing it. I've had some amazing success stories to share um, and including a set of twins. And um, I've had patients that after I prescribed it, went home and decided it wasn't for them. They were gonna go ahead with an abortion, often due to pressure from boyfriends or family members um, as well. But um, a lot of the hospital systems are concerned about the risks and, you know, for um, lawsuits involved um, because there is very little knowledge about the you know, the use of progesterone is kind of, a, this is kind of an off-label use, if you will. But yet, uh, we give it to pregnant women to help them sustain threatened miscarriages. Dr. Dehan, you may even be able to add to that. Mary, I think you, I think you summed that up really well. I don't have a lot to add, but I, I would reiterate that in terms of um, my colleagues and, and those in the, in the American college that we faced the same Re, you know, response that there's not any evidence, the studies are small, the numbers are small, we don't have that. And on the other hand, you don't see any, you know, any of them running out to try to do the studies to see if that's something that, you know, they have no interest in, right. in putting any effort or, or finances to, to doing those studies. And it's not something that I, I think with limited resources, it's, it's easy to get huge numbers on this. This is a, a, a fairly rare, at, you know, at this stage in, in its, as it's, an, you know, um, sort of its nascency, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly rare thing. Um, I agree, you know, I, I think it's, you know, the times that we've discussed it, we don't, we don't do it at our institution. It's been, you know, discussed here and there, but the, the response is always, oh, that's not really, you know, standard of care. Uh, I think we use a lot of medications that are off label and um, we, we do that not infrequently that people don't have a problem with, but um, this is, this has been a much harder sell. I, I, I applaud you for, for doing that. I, um, you know, I, I think that that should be an option for women. Well, I, I will add that um, my institution asked me to stop doing it because of um, their risk of malpractice. And um, I am hoping at some point that maybe we can take this 
more to the Council of Bishops and maybe come out with a statement saying that this is something that is for the greater good of women and it's worth doing. Um, I'm not sure how to make that happen, but I do think it's something that we, we do need to look at. Um, and I'm saddened in the fact that I am not able to provide that care for women. I have a couple of resources where I can send patients now for um, the abortion pill reversal protocol. But I will tell you, um, I will never forget the morning at 6.30 a.m. and I was in my car out to buy donuts for my family when I received a phone call from the abortion pill reversal uh, organization asking me to take a phone call from a desperate mother. And um, when they connected me with her and she is desperately sobbing on the phone, begging me to help her, how can anybody, anyone say no? Um, and ultimately she did give birth to her son and um, it, it made it worthwhile for me to be able to take that step I don't consider it a risky step. I, I consider it that we may not have full knowledge of, of the use of this, but as Dr. Dehan said, we use a lot of off-label medications to caring for our patients. If we use that as a disclosure saying, you know, the evidence is small, but it might be worth trying. We do that all the time in medicine. I don't see why we shouldn't be doing it for these ladies. Thanks, Mary. We have time for one very sort of lightning round, short answer, um, uh, one, one or two sentences, and then we'll have to close out this wonderful discussion. So the University of Notre Dame is institutionally committed to promoting a culture of life and organizations and, inst and institutions within Notre Dame, like the McGrath Institute and the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture and other and, and countless other faculty and students and staff are devoted to building a culture of life and a civilization of love in a post-Dobbs world, uh, a landscape in which moms and babies and families are cared for the right way. You all are on the front lines of this struggle to care for moms and babies and families. What is, what is one thing that we should keep in mind that we should do to, to, to work towards this goal together in a loving way that extends unconditional love and care and solidarity to all? Let's start with, uh, let's start with Dr. Kamosi and then we'll, we'll go through one, one or two sentences. One of the things that um, the abortion pill reversal discussion reveals and is uncomfortable for our opponents on this is just how much how many women are uh, being pushed to have abortions they don't want to have. And often they're uh, women of color, often they're economically vulnerable women, and often often it's men who threaten intimate partner violence as part of the process of, of coercing them into having abortions they want, don't want to have. What I, what I think we ought to focus on, in addition to many other things that are available to us is um, providing housing, especially for women who are threatened by intimate partner violence. It's one of the most uh, unfortunately expensive interventions we can make, um, but especially in light of how often abortion correlates with intimate partner violence, and especially women that have multiple abortions, we need to get housing for these women. We need to get them out of the violent situations in which they find themselves. That's great. Thank you so much, Charlie. Uh, Dr. Piccioni. Uh, Thomas B. Merton said, that uh, action flows from contemplation. As a moral theologian and as an attorney, but primarily as a moral theologian, I believe increasingly that the Catholic worldview or imaginary really begins with uh, uh, that experience of God and spirituality. So to connect everything together and to pray the simple prayer, uh, Father Hes apparently it was Father Hesburgh's favorite prayer that he would repeat during the day, come Holy Spirit that we would have the eyes to see not only the individual before us, but as Charlie said, the, the social dimensions of the reality in, in which they live. So increasingly, it is uh, seeing the big picture and having confidence in the, in the spirit of life and love to carry us through. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dehan. 
Well, I think I can only speak as a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and, and, I'll, and I'll kind of call out my colleagues that what we need to do in the exam room with the patients when we're there face to face is help them get the resources that they need to know that they can support their child and support their family. And as an adjunct to that, when I have the medical student in the room with me to help them see that, that, that they can join this field, they can be in medicine with these views to, to help these women understand that um, choosing life is a, is a, you know, a viable option for them. Finally, Mary. I would um, certainly say encourage the use of midwives out in the community, um, in clinics, um, especially in underserved areas of the city and rural areas. Um, they tend to um, provide connections for the community. The roots of midwives came back in the days of, you know, village grannies and people that they trusted. Um, fortunately, today, it's not just the granny midwife. We're well-educated uh, in our field, um, but patients have the opportunities to create relationships with their midwives, with their family docs, with their obstetricians. Um, when we can really nurture relationships with our patients, they can come to trust us and um, we can together help solve their problems. Wonderful. Uh, Jess, why don't you, why don't you take, us, take us out? Sure, friends. Thank you so much for joining us today for this really rich and layered conversation about how we can move forward um, to embrace the flourishing of women and children and embrace our practice of medicine um, uh, moving forward post Dobbs. We wanna thank in particular our presenters um, and also our audience members for joining us today. Uh, Christina will drop in the link for the next uh, panel, which will be at the end of October. Please take a moment to sign up for that and also be on the lookout for the uh, video recording of this webinar early next week. So thanks again for joining us and have a great afternoon.